That is the best kind of notification and you guys already know what that means. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify and the moment another business dream becomes a reality. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. And thanks to the 24-7 help and extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash manifest, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash manifest to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash manifest. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Manifest with Tori D. Simone. I'm your host, Tori D. Simone, and I'm so excited to be podcasting and talking. I'm in such a chatty mood right now. I was on my run this morning and I was literally like having a podcast to myself this morning, just like talking out loud and podcasting like to myself I was talking about literally nothing um but I was just you know how like when you run well when I run it's like a 50 50 if I bring headphones or not well I normally always bring headphones but then when I'm out running it's like a 50 50 if I'm actually going to use them or not and today I didn't use headphones and on the days when I run without music or podcast or anything like that I will think, obviously, most of the time, but instead of just like letting the thoughts hang out in my brain, I just like spoke them out loud today and I was like having like a whole conversation with myself for an hour and yeah, I was in like the chattiest mood ever, which is great. Like I was so happy to be super chatty today because I was like, oh, thank God it's Thursday. I'm podcasting today, but I was like, don't get tired, girl. Like I don't want to tire myself out um, by podcasting alone on my run. I would have recorded it, but it, trust me, it had no substance. Like I don't even remember. Oh, I do remember. I was really working through like what my summer workout routine was going to be because with like the shore and the studio opening, like we really only open, um, we're open in the mornings and not really at night. So I was like, how is that going to work with my runs? And I was like working through all that and like what times I'm teaching and stuff like that. So that's really what I was working through on my run today out loud. And then I started talking about coffee and I was like, maybe I should go to a coffee shop after this. And anyway, I was just super chatty today and I was really glad that I was really chatty because I podcast today and I wanted to be really chatty for the podcast. So happy April, everyone. Uh, today is April 3rd, which is actually my birthday. Um, I turned 25 today and this whole episode is about turning 25 and the lessons that I've learned by 25. I will get into it in just a couple of minutes, but I am so excited to be turning 25 and I really feel like I've been waiting my whole life to be 25 and I'll get into why in a minute. It's like kind of cutie. But I do want to say happy April, happy Aries season to all of my Aries out there. We are, we're a tough bunch, us Aries, and it's time for us to roar. You know, I am so excited (laughs) that it's Aries time. And I feel like so many people that I like really heavily like fuck with in my life are Aries and they all have birthdays around this time. And I'm like, now it makes sense. <laughs> like I knew I liked you, but now I really know that I like you. You know what I mean? No, I'm just kidding. It's just because us air, like I really do identify as an Aries. Like I feel like I really hit all the characteristics of an Aries and everyone that I really like and it's their birthdays. I'm like, man, I knew I liked you for good reason because they're Aries. No, I'm just kidding because of a lot of reasons, but um, I really do like the Aries bunch. We're a good group. We're a cool group of kids anyway. um, Yeah, today is my birthday, April 3rd, and I'm turning 25 today. Woo! Um, But before I get into 25 and the life lessons that I've learned by 25, I do want to say that I released an April Start Digital Planner. I released it last Saturday, um, so I guess two Saturdays ago now. And that is out on my Etsy shop and on the manifestplanner.com. If you guys want a digital planner that starts in April, it goes from April of 2023 until March of 2024, then this is the planner for you. I'm someone that I 
really like a fresh start every season, every quarter. And for me, because it was my birthday, I wanted a fresh planner. So selfishly, I did make this for myself. But I also know that, you know, January is old news, girl. Like that's old, dusty, past, see ya. I don't know January. I'm only spring. Thank you. So January's out and April is in. So if you guys want a planner that starts in April, I've made it. It's on my Etsy shop and on the manifestplanner.com. And it's a digital download. I am working on not one, not two, but three new hardcover um, products that I am so excited about and I will have more details on very soon. I'm looking at those being released around the fall time. Think like academic year is when those will be released and I'm really excited for them. So I'm working on that and yeah. So for right now, I do have a new digital planner that is April start available now for $19.95. And yeah, I hope you guys love it as much as I do. So, um, like I was saying earlier, it's my birthday, I'm 25 today, and I am so ready to be 25. I've really been sitting with myself this past week, and as I enter the year 25, which is technically my 26th year, I have so much intention, direction, and purpose. Quick tangent, I remember it was like my, I think my 16th birthday or my 15th birthday, one of the two, my grandparents sent me a card. I think it was my 15th birthday. They sent me a card and they were like, as you enter your 16th year. And I was like, mom, did my grandpa know that I'm 15, not 16? And my mom and then my grandparents explained that like, when you turn one, you've already lived a year. So you're entering your second year when you turn one, like from zero to one, like that's a year. And then you turn one, but like you've been alive and around longer than one. You know what I mean? So like, I don't know if anyone else thinks about time like that or they do birthdays like that. But with my family, whenever we turn in in age, we're entering the next age's year. So like I'm 25 today, so I'm entering my 26th year. You know what I mean? Anyway, I'm 25 though. I just feel like I have so much intention and direction and purpose. And I feel so aligned with myself as I enter year 25. My goal for the next five years from 25 to 29 is to really step into my power and grind. And what I mean through this is not like the toxic hustle culture, rise and grind, baby. Like that's not at all what I mean by the word grind. But what I really mean is to put the work in my life, um, in all aspects of my life. And it's really to use ages 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29 to set me up for my 30s so that when I am 30, I can really like enjoy the fruits of my labor and just have a really solid life. That's what I mean by grind. Um, And I just want to continue trying as much as I can in my 20s and trying on as many different hats and trying as many different careers and just exploring as many different avenues of my life as possible for these next five years so that when I enter my 30s, I have a very established career And so that I'm really set and very confident in who I am as a person. So from 25 to 29, I am grinding. I am laying the foundation for a beautiful life that is to come. And I am so excited. I used the manifest worksheets, which is the first 10 pages of any manifest planner products that I have out. And I also have just like those worksheets out. If you guys, it's great for a birthday. It's great for New Year's. It's great for an idea, a business plan, anything like that. I'll have it linked down below as well. But I use the manifest worksheets to really write out where I wanted to be for my life by the time I was 30. And what I also really wanted to be entering 25 
and I feel so aligned with myself and I really had some reoccurring themes come up that I want to talk about. Themes such as stepping into my power was a really big one. Being a woman, okay, and really embracing the feminine energy and just being a woman, like that was really coming up a lot. Like I just really want to be a woman and being very intentional with my time, my energy, my commitments, what I say yes to, what I say no to, my work and my friendships and my relationship and really just like building a very solid foundation for my life. And kind of what I said in the beginning, I feel as though I've been waiting my whole life to be 25. I really do. And what I mean by this is that when I was little, like four, five, or six years old, I remember idolizing Britney Spears. And I loved her so much because she would just wear these little crop tops and she was such a pop star and she was so pretty and so grown up and so mature. And I was just like obsessed. I remember my best friend Brees and I would play like Barbies in her basement and we would pretend that like one of the Barbies was Britney Spears and we would be like, we can't wait until we can grow older and go to a Britney Spears concert. Like I was just obsessed with Britney Spears because she was girly and pop and fun and she was like everything that I thought like girls are when they grow up. And I was obsessed. And then I remember when I got in high school, I was like obsessed with Blair Fowler Juicy Star 07 for like all the OGs. Um, And I was like so obsessed with her because she was in high school and she was in college and she was so girly and so mature and so grown and so ahead of her years. And I also just remember being a kid and just whenever we had babysitters, like I just loved my babysitters because I always thought they were so grown and so girly and so mature. And I remember one time I asked my babysitter, I was like, what time do you go to bed? And she's like, I don't have a bedtime. And I'm like, oh my God, you're so grown. Like, I just have always really looked up to older girls and I've always wanted to be one of the older girls. Like I always wanted to be my babysitters. I always wanted to be Britney Spears. I always wanted to be Blair Fowler. I always wanted to be like one of those girls that smelled good and wore makeup and like wore high heels and chewed bubble gum and like had purses. Like I always just wanted to be like one of those girls. And that was just as a kid, like that's all I wanted to be. I was so girly as a kid. I was just, I just idolized older girls around me. And like, I just loved being around like that energy. And like, that was just always who I wanted to be when I grew up. Like I was like, I just love being a girl. Like I've always really loved being a girl. And I don't think I'll ever say that otherwise. Like you probably will never catch me being like, man, I wish I was a guy some days. No way. I love being a girl. I've always loved being a girl. Um, and I just used to think like when I was younger, like, I just can't wait to be one of those girls that like I always idolized. And you know, what's so funny is that I was always so confused about college and then like what comes after college. Like I understood that like, you know, you grew up, you went to high school, you went to college, but then I thought immediately after college, you were like married with like kids. Like I never really knew that there was like a post-grad moment Um, I'd say like, honestly, until like maybe the middle of middle school, I was very confused about like what happens after college. I thought you like meet your boyfriend in college and then you guys get married like in college. Like, I don't know. I just was really confused. So I never really realized that like there's a gap between college and then being married with kids. So honestly, by the time I thought I was 25, I thought like I would be probably married with a kid just because I didn't really know like the gap like not everyone obviously has the gap but I'd say the majority of people do but I still thought that I'd be like the cutest girliest like most confident version of me and now I can like really confidently say that the age has come like from 18 to 24 I have honestly felt like the same like at 18 I mean I'm 24 as I'm recording this episode because I'm recording it on March 30th Maybe I'll drastically change by Monday, but I feel like I've definitely grown so much from the time I was 18 to 24 and I've learned so much and I'm really like such a different person. Like physically, I look very different. Emotionally, I am very different, but I felt the same in terms of um, 
confidence, but now that I'm actually speaking this out loud, I feel like my confidence has went up and then back down. Like when you're young, I'm still young. I know that. But like when you're really young, like 18, 19, 20, people would always say like, oh, you think you know everything. And I knew I didn't. And I always remember that. I was like, I know I don't know everything, but I felt really confident what I was doing. And then I feel like when the pandemic hit like 20, 22, 23, I started to kind of like get a couple notches of my confidence knocked out of me. Like I kind of just felt like, you know, like shit can happen. Like the world can just sweep the rug up from under you and you don't even know it. And like that kind of rocked me a little bit. I felt like I was more confident at 18, 19, 20, 21 than I was at 22 and 23. And now I'm kind of, re- I'm really getting my, that confidence back again. And that feels really good. That kind of goes into the whole stepping into my power sort of thing that I was talking about earlier. But for the most part, ages 18 to 24 have felt pretty similar in terms of age. Um, you're very young. You're figuring a lot of things out. You have just enough independence and confidence to where you feel independent. (laughs) Okay. But to where you feel like you're an adult and where you feel like you're treated seriously, but you're still young enough where you can fuck up and you can be stupid and you can be dumb and you can just chalk it up to like, well, I'm, I'm stupid and I'm dumb. Like I remember there was this one and I don't, I don't mean dumb. You can't say the words DNS. What's DNS? Dumb and stupid. James Kennedy. Anyway, I remember I had this one student teacher in history class in junior year of high school and he was a student at Penn State and it was his last day and he was like guys it's been such a pleasure teaching for you um he was awesome by the way but he was like it's such a pleasure teaching for you guys um and if I could leave you with any advice it's to be young and stupid now because you can be old and stupid but your excuse now is that you're young so live it up try on do as many different things as you can live it up and just be stupid and make mistakes. And I like, didn't really knew what that meant at the time, but now I look back and I'm like, he's so right. Like this is the time to try as many different things in life as you can and learn and fuck up or succeed and learn from everything. And I really feel like from ages 18 to 24, I've had the flexibility to try so many different things and I've had the backing from so many different people and support from so many different people to try so many things. And Hey, if I like it, awesome. If I don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, so I just feel like for the most part, it's been the same, but now entering 25, I really feel like I have begun to shed an old identity of myself and enter a new one to come at age 25. And I feel like that isn't really talked about. And maybe I should make a whole episode about letting go of an identity because it really does take time. Like it's a mourning process. It's a grieving process. And whether it's an identity or an idea or a career path or whatever it might be. And I see this in myself. I see it in friends. I see it in my relationship. Like there are so many instances where you think your life is going one direction and then it goes a completely opposite one. And you have to like grieve the loss of a life that you thought you were going to live. And It might not be as dramatic as it sounds, but it is like a learning process and a learning curve. And I learn, I talk a lot about that in therapy, like of things that I'm going through and I'm just real, I'm learning that it's like, it's a grieving process almost. So I feel like I've been shedding an old identity of myself that I'll kind of get into in a couple minutes and I'm entering a new one come age 25 and it just feels so right and it feels so good. So as I enter 25, I have so much intention, but I'm also so ready to make my inner child is like a big buzzword right now, (laughs) but I'm like really ready to make like little Tori so proud and like little five, six year old Tori be like, wow, like you are actually the girl I always wanted to be. And I'm so ready to become like just so woman this year, you know, like I always wanted to be like this cute girly, like girly girl, you know what I mean? But like, I'm really ready to become a woman <laughs> and, and just like be mature and grown up and confident and like sexy and like all the things of what I think a woman is like, I'm so ready to embody that and step into that power. 
and really like dig into my feminine energy. I'm so excited for it. Um, the last few years, I feel like I've really been fighting with feminine energy and like becoming like more of a woman to me and like really stepping into that because I just feel like I've been fighting it with whatever the trends are and actually fitness, believe it or not. So let me back up. Like in high school, I was so girly and like I had a little like emo Tumblr phase. Like honestly, who didn't? It was a really fun phase, but I was still really girly for the most part. Like I would get dressed really cute every day. I would do my makeup every day. I would do my hair every day. And I was just like obsessed with being a girl. It was so fun. Like I was like, flirty and fun. And like, I'd go shopping for clothes and makeup shopping. I'd get my hair done. I do my hair every day. And I was also doing makeup tutorials on YouTube at the time. So like I was so into beauty and I thought I wanted to be a makeup artist at the time. And I would get dressed up for like events and YouTube events. And I would, I was just so girly and it was so much fun. And then I found fitness and my girly side, like kind of took a back seat because I would go from wearing like jeans and cute tops every day to wearing workout clothes more often than not. And I would wear less makeup than I would because I would be working out and my hair would be done less because I would just get it sweaty. So like, what's the point? And then fitness sort of became my identity, especially when I opened up stride, which all of this was and is fine. But all this to say is that my identity changed. And don't get me wrong, like I was still girly. Like when I would go to spin, like I was wearing makeup. I was like wearing crop tops and like sports bras. And like I would like try to be as cute as I could, like when I was doing spin and everything like that. And I still try my best. Like I still want to be like cutie, girly. Like that's just who I have always really been at my core is like cutie, girly girl. Like that's just who I've always been. So all of this is to say that my like identity has just sort of like shifted a little bit from being like super girly and then into fitness, all of which was fine. And I was loving it. You know, I was having fun, but then COVID hit and the trends became very natural, no makeup, slick back hairstyles, sweatpants, very loose baggy fitting clothes. So once I sort of like reentered society, if you will, as a real person that wasn't wearing workout clothes, I was immediately just in baggy clothes and never really like revisited my feminine energy. And when I would try to wear stuff that like I feel like I used to like wearing like skinny jeans or like honestly, you know what shirts I always think about? Those like Hollister. Oh my God, I like this sounds so chuggy, but those Hollister um, long sleeve shirts that had the buttons on them and like the arm sleeves were like five times the length of the shirt. Like honestly, what was up with that? But I think about shirts like that because I felt so pretty in those shirts. And I remember I had one that was hot pink. And on the days that I wore that hot pink shirt, like I felt so pretty and so girly. And I like I can't remember like what grade I was in, but I just remember like when I would have a crush at school and I would probably middle school then when I would wear those shirts, like I would just feel like, oh my God, like I know he's looking at me today. Like, you know what I mean? Like I was just so like girly. So when I kind of like wanted to not wear fitness clothes during the day and then wear like real people clothes, quote unquote, in the past couple of years, I've just felt lost because it was like baggy clothes. And whenever I would try to wear clothes that I used to like, I just felt really out of style and really like chuggy and like not in trend. And I didn't really like feeling like that, but I, it was like a rock and a hard place. You know, I was like, I want to be on trend and like kind of wear like what's cute and what's in right now and like what all the girls are wearing. But at the same time, I don't feel very girly and pretty and cute in this stuff. I kind of just feel like I'm drowning my body out in these clothes that I don't think are very flattering on me. And like, I don't want to wear my hair in a slick back bun. I don't want to wear minimal makeup. Like I want to wear makeup and I want to wear pink and I want to be girly. And like, I want to wear skinny jeans. God damn it. You know what I mean? But I just sort of felt like I was just kind of like struggling revisiting my feminine energy. And I felt like I lost it in the past couple of years. I feel like I lost my voice in a, in a certain areas of my life. I feel like I lost my feminine energy a lot I kind of lost like who I wanted to be and just did what I thought I should be doing. And I was showing up as who I thought I should be showing up as. And this past year, 
And through therapy, I've really begun to learn so much about myself and kind of relearn who I am at my core and who I want to be at my core. I actually started going to therapy. I was talking about this the other day. I started going to therapy just because I wanted to talk to someone about something that was going on um, in my relationship, but I didn't want to like burden my friends with it. And so that's why I initially started going to therapy and it became such a transformative journey for me that after like literally two sessions, like we never even talked about anything in my relationship. It's like just been about like me and learning so much stuff about myself And that has like really changed the game for me in so much stuff. And it's just made me so much more confident in who I am and who I'm becoming. And I'm like so ready to reclaim who I am at my core, which is like a woman. I am like so ready. I keep saying this, but it's because it's like, I just feel so ready to really step into this feminine energy and step into this power. I'm ready to not be timid. I'm ready to use my voice. I'm ready to stand up. I'm ready to take up space. That is something that I find myself doing all the time. I find myself being so small. Like I'll give you an example. Like when I am walking on the sidewalk and someone is coming towards me, I will always move to get out of their way. I, and and meanwhile, they normally don't move, but I'm always the one to move. But I'm like, realizing like I deserve to be on the sidewalk just as much as anyone else and not to say I won't move for someone but I'm saying like I won't maybe be the first to like immediately dart out of my way um something else that I think about like on my runs when I'm on the trail and I'm running I'm always on the edge of the trail I'm never like comfortably on a side I'm never really in the middle I'm always on the edge of the trail because I'm always like oh well someone else is gonna want to you know eventually pass me on the trail But it's like, I deserve to be on the trail just as much as the person that's going to pass me. And if they want to pass me, like they can go around me or they can like tell me to move and like I can move over for them. You know what I mean? But like, I deserve to be on the trail just as much as the person next to me on the trail. Like, so things like that, like I'm just ready to take up space in my life and to not be afraid to be present. And I find myself being timid in a lot of situations that I'm like ready to not be timid. Like I'm ready to take up space. And I'm ready for my seat at the table and I'm ready to just claim all that has been made for me and all that is ready for me. Like I'm ready for it, whatever it is. I'm open to seeing whatever that is. And I'm going to do this all while being feminine and girly and just like so me. Like I really do feel like I've been waiting for 25 years to become 25 and I am just so excited to be 25 like when I'm six years old like this is the age that I've been waiting for like 25 like you're gonna be so girly and have your life together and be so cute like I'm ready to be 25 like this is like I feel like what I've been waiting my whole life for and 25 is like it's a whole ass adult like it's a whole ass woman like I am so excited to be 25 and really step into who I am and step into myself so To kind of tie this up before I get into the lessons, like I have a lot of intentions and a lot of positive energy going into 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. And I really can't believe that I'm in my mid 20s. And I feel like I literally just turned 21 yesterday. It is so crazy. Um, And it's crazy how fast the years have flown by. Like I think of when I'm 29 and I'm like, wow, that's forever away. But it's the same distance as like today to 21. And that's really wild. Um, But I'm just so excited to lay the foundation for these next five years of my life. I am in the midst of building a life that I'm really proud of. And I want to continue to build a life that I can only dream of. So on April 3rd, 2028, on my 30th birthday, I can come on this podcast and say that I'm living a life that I never thought was possible, that I dreamed a life like this, but I didn't know that I could live it or how I could live it. But here I am, I did it. And for that, I am so excited. So this is what I will be doing for the next five years. I'll be building my dream life and stepping into my power and my feminine energy while I do so. And like, ah, I'm just so excited so excited. So happy birthday to me, 25. I try, like I used to be so about birthdays and I used to like literally count down the days until my birthday. And I used to just love my birthday. And I feel like from 20, I don't know, 21, maybe 
no, I liked my 21st birthday a lot, but like 22, 23, 24, I've kind of just, I just like wanted very like chill, low key birthdays. 25, same thing. Like I don't really have any plans for my birthday. Like I'm not doing anything, but I'm really excited for my birthday because of all the intentions that I have set for the next five years. So that is why I'm really excited for my birthday this year. Um, I'm teaching spin tonight, probably going to go to dinner this past weekend. Um, I don't think I'm like doing much. I'm going, I'm having dinner with my parents on Sunday night and my boyfriend and I are going to do something probably on Saturday, but it's not like I have like anything like crazy planned for my birthday. But anyway, that's how I'm entering 25. And I hope that resonated with some of you and maybe a couple of you guys have felt similar And maybe this has like ignited a fire in some of you guys to be like, I want to feel like this or whatever it might be. But anyway, that's um, how I'm entering 25 and I just feel really aligned with it and really, really good. And I'm just so excited. So, okay, now let's talk about some really hard hitting and valuable lessons that I've learned leading up to this age of 25. And I will say a lot of my transformative years have been as of late um, like 23 and a half (laughs) up until like today, like really therapy has like, I, like there's me (laughs) pre-therapy and during therapy and I'm like during therapy. And like I said, I started therapy because of just like something that was going on in my relationship. And I just wanted to talk about it with someone that like wasn't biased and that wasn't my friends. And it just became so much more about me and about, Um, how I interact with other people and I have just learned so much about myself and it's just been such an amazing journey and so incredible and yeah so I feel like a lot of these shifts have occurred because of therapy so I've so I have therapy to thank for like literally everything good in my life I feel like Um, and yeah I'm really excited so I wanted to have 25 lessons by 25, but honestly, I couldn't think of 25 and I wanted them to all be good. So I thought that I'd have like six when I went to write down this episode, but I actually have 18, which is pretty good. So I have 18 lessons that have really changed my life and have either been light bulb moments or, um, are hard hitting lessons that I've just had to learn or that I've had epiphanies in. But anyway, um, let's get into them. That is the best kind of notification, and you guys already know what that means. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify, and the moment another business dream becomes a reality. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're selling the manifest planner or merch, Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, and it even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. And thanks to the 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. So the manifestplanner.com is hosted by Shopify and it is so easy. Before entering the like e-commerce world, I was so confused. I had so many questions. I had no idea how to ship a product, how to list a product, how to like make it look professional, but Shopify has made it so easy. And I think you guys would be surprised at how some of like the biggest brands and businesses in the world use Shopify as a hosting site. And the process is so streamlined. It's so gorgeous. It's so simple for people like me and for like fortune 500 companies, Shopify is the way to go. Now it's your turn to get serious about selling and try Shopify today. This is possibility powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash manifest, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash manifest to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash manifest. Okay, so the first one is I personify my insecurities into people. Now, this has been a really big light bulb moment for me when I learned this. And let me give you an example. If I was, all right, let me think of a good example here. If I was working through something um, that I am insecure about, like when I was releasing the planners, 
I was really confident in the product that I was making, but I had insecurities of how it would be perceived by other people. Like, would it look like I was falling behind in my life? Would it look like I was just like grabbing for something? Like all these intrusive thoughts that were insecurities of mine, I would put into the mouths of other people being like, oh, well, this person is going to say this about it. And this person is going to say this about it. And this person is going to say this. And, you know, like I would just put my insecurities into the words of other people and be like, well, I know that this person that like was an old friend of mine, like wants to see me fail. So like they're going to say this. But in reality, it was just me putting my insecurities into other people so that I would have someone else to blame when really I just had to look inward and be like, you know, you know what, Tori, like those are actually your own insecurities that you're putting into other people. So you have someone to blame, but really the only thing you have to do is look inward. That was a really, really, really big light bulb moment for me. And kind of one when, when we learned that, or when I, I guess I should say, learn that in therapy, it was kind of just like a, huh? So I'm the problem. And it was just like this, this big moment for me where I was like, okay, like now that I know this, like I'm going to work through it. And I've been able to really recognize that a lot. Like if I feel like some, if I, if I start putting the blame in someone else and I'm like, oh, well, they're going to say this. I now know that it's stemming from myself. Like it's my own insecurity that I'm putting onto someone else so that I can blame them for my own insecurity. And that was like a huge light bulb moment for me. So yeah, personifying my insecurities into other people has been something that I'm now very aware of. And I really take responsibility and accountability for it. And that's been really big for me. And it's been a really awesome life lesson to like look inward on that and be like, you know what? No one's actually saying any of this. It's all just me. It's all internal. So that was number one. Number two, Alcohol has served me no good and I am so much better without it. When I think back to like when I was, you know, five, six, seven, thinking about like this version of myself that I was going to be when I was older, it like alcohol was never even a thing in my mind. Like I was never like, I can't wait to have a glass of wine. Like, no, it was for me. It was like, I can't wait to wear high heels and have a pink purse and like a convertible like that. Like I literally wanted to be like Elle Woods. Like that was like my whatever. So alcohol was never something that like I always like really looked up to. And then when it just became like a social norm around me and my friends and culture and just like growing up, like it was just something that I never just felt so inclined to do, but I just did it because I was like, I should like to drink. Like everyone else around me likes to drink. Like, why don't I? So once I just like really gave up alcohol and I have two episodes that are specifically about giving up alcohol, I'll link them below. Once I just sort of gave it up and I'm, and I've said this in the last episode of my last, um, episode about podcast or about, um, alcohol. I said that like maybe I I won't give it up forever and I I don't know if I will or not, but I don't see myself drinking anytime soon just because I just feel so much better without it. I am so much calmer of a person without alcohol. It is wild to me. I'm so calm. I really don't have as much anxiety. I find that I'm not triggered by a lot of things nowadays. That could be because of therapy. It could be because of alcohol. I really don't know, but I find it like kind of coincidental that I'm so much more calm, less triggered. I'm not angry. Um, and I'm just really at peace with my life. And I feel like a lot of these changes have happened since I cut out alcohol And it's just really wild to think about. Like I'll look back at old text messages and I used to be such a screenshotter. Like I would screenshot all old messages and I don't even know why, but like I just would. It was just like a teenager thing of me to do. And I was just like always fighting with people. Like I was always like fighting with friends or like just having like the most out of pocket responses. Like for what? Like for literally no reason. And the last like year, year and a half, I just feel like I've been so calm about everything. Like something will happen and I get really worked up about something and I just kind of like let it chill for like an hour and then I'm good. You know what I mean? Like I'm just not as reactive as I used to be. And I just really feel like alcohol 
was the catalyst of that. And I didn't even drink a lot. Like that's what's crazy is I rarely feel like I ever honestly, if ever was drunk in my whole life, I've never been hungover. I never blacked out. I never was really anything more than tipsy or buzzed. And I still had these sort of like reactions in my life. Um, and I just feel like alcohol just served me no good. And I'm really now able just to make really deep connections with people, find valuable, um, time and do valuable activities with other people And I just see like a whole new side of life without alcohol. So yeah, I love living this sober, curious life. I don't know if it's sober, curious. I don't know if it's sober. I don't know. I feel like sober is not the right word, even though I don't, I guess I am sober all the time. Um, I just don't feel like it's my word to claim, but nonetheless, I love not drinking alcohol. Um, The third life lesson The art of not being triggered is a real undertaking, but it's one that is so worth it. And this is maybe a hot take, but I have the choice whether to be triggered or not to be triggered when it comes to certain things. Um, Obviously, this has the exception, like everything in life. But for me and my day to day life, I am so blessed and so fortunate that I don't have anything that like triggers like a PTSD response or something like that, like something so extreme where like you actually can't control it. But for me, like anything that I feel quote unquote triggered by, I can control. Meaning if someone says something that I don't like, or I don't agree with, or maybe like strikes a nerve with me, that's my choice to be reactive to that or not. If I see something on Instagram that I don't really like, or see something that like internally really annoys me and like eats at me that's up to me to be triggered by that or not like other people are not living their life to tiptoe around my feelings and it's my decision to be triggered or not um and that has been really tough and don't get me wrong like there are things still and probably always will be that like get under my skin and like get to me and I'm like oh I just I don't want to see that stuff. You know, I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to see it. I don't want to talk about it. Like there are definitely some people and situations and circumstances that I'm like, I don't even want to like bring that energy into my life right now. But how I react to those certain people, situations, whatever it might be, that is my choice. And that has been a really tough pill to swallow. And I'm not saying this is easy. And I honestly don't even have the answer to this. But that's what I've learned very recently is that for me in my life, the choice of being triggered is up to me and how I react to a situation is up to me. And that's a tough pill to swallow. So I'm still working through that. I don't even have an answer to that. I don't have a solution to it, but I am aware of it. So now whenever I see something that I don't like, or I get a text that I don't like, or I get an email that really just like annoys me or whatever it is, whatever it is, it's up to me to let that get at me and eat at me or not. And that's like hard to do, man. That's really hard to do, but it is a choice at the end of the day. And again, I want to say I'm not talking about like physical triggers, okay? I'm not talking about like horrible things that have happened and then you get like a trigger of that and it causes like a PTSD. I'm not talking about that. That's obviously very different. I'm talking about like if I see something on Instagram that annoys me, okay? <laughs> like leaving a hate comment. Like obviously I would never leave a hate comment, but do you get, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You guys are my people. You understand me. Okay, number four. I want to thank Taylor Swift and my therapist for this one. I want to thank my therapist for all of these. Number four, I am the problem, but I am also the solution. This is what kind of going back to number one um, about I personify my insecurities into other people. Everything that I feel like I struggle with in my life, it's so easy to put the blame on other people and on circumstances that we can't control. But nine times out of 10, like we really are, we need to do the inner work and we need to look inward and be like, okay, well, why does this bother me? Why am I reacting this way? Why do I feel like I need to do X, Y, Z? Why do I feel like I need to say X, Y, Z, whatever it might be? So while I have 
the problem and I am the problem. I'm also the solution. I have the answers inside of me. I just have to pull them out and set my ego aside and like really look at the situation at hand or whatever it is in front of me from a different lens and at a a different objective um, and a different perspective. And that is hard to do. Um, I'm reading this book called MetaHuman. It's taken me a really long time to get through this book because it's so deep and it's so introspective that it's like, it's a hard book to just read because like you read it and then you're like, okay, how am I supposed to return to like life after this? Like, I feel like I'm like vibrating and I'm elevated and I'm like having an out of body experience and I'm like not even a human, like what am I? And then I'm supposed to just like return back to like normal life. Like it's a weird it's a weird book to read. So I have to read it in like doses and stuff. But one of the opening lines of the book was like, have you ever been mad and been able to view yourself being mad? And that is kind of like where I'm getting at. It's like, I'm the problem, but I'm also the solution. Have I been able to remove myself from the problem to find the solution? Have I been able to challenge myself to think differently, to problem solve, to where I realize like, you know what? Like, this is on you, but you're also the way out of it. So that's been really transformative to learn as well. Kind of another open-ended one that I don't really have the answer to at the moment, but I'm still working through that. And that's been really huge for me to learn is that like, I'm the problem, but I am also the solution. Number five, I cannot give someone or something energy if it's not given to me. Meaning, Um, Let's think about the life pie. So the life pie is a tool that I have in the manifest planner and um, it's simply, hang on, let me get out my planner because it's right next to me. If you guys are watching this on video, which you should be watching on video because video is awesome. Um, Manifest with Tori DeSimone YouTube channel. So if you guys are watching the video, I'm holding up the life pie. So this is the life pie um, and you can see that there are like life priorities and then we assign an amount of pie size to our life priorities. So if career takes up 50% of your life, then like in your life pie, 50% of the circle will be to your career. If 5% is about finances and 5% of your life will be allotted to finances, stuff like that. Um, so what this means is that if someone or something, or a situation, whatever it is, whether it's a person, or a situation, or a job, or like literally anything, is causing me stress, or I'm overthinking about something, or I'm just letting something eat at me, if it if I'm giving it more time of my day than my life pie allots to, I'm giving it way too much time. I'm like really letting it live rent free in my mind and it is not helping at all on the flip side of that if I I I think about this a lot with like people for example like if I'm really worried about someone for whatever reason maybe um I feel like they've been really distant with me so I'm trying to like be I'm overcompensating you know in a friendship and being like are you okay? Like, did it like, or in a work relationship or it could be anything. Like, I just feel like maybe someone's being distant with me or I feel like maybe I could have wronged someone or whatever it might be. And I try to overcompensate for it. And I really like fester on it. And I really overthink about it. I think, is this person giving me the same amount of attention nine times out of 10 or even is this person giving me the same amount of thought? Okay, because if this is really consuming my mind, my thoughts, my brain all the time, I can guarantee like nine times out of 10, the answer is going to be no from the other camp. Like they are not thinking about me as much as I'm thinking about them. So I need to kind of just back off a little bit. Like there's a saying and I'm going to butcher it. Um, Maybe I won't. Okay, let me give myself a little bit more credit. There's a saying where it's like out of out of my hands, out of my control. And that is true to a situation like this, where I feel like if the other person is not giving this situation as much attention or free rent in your mind as much as I am, then it's not worth it for me to be overthinking about it. Um, And this is hard for me. This is really hard for me. I talk about this so much in therapy where I say like, well, this is really bothering me because da-da-da. And my therapist will be like, well, do you think this person is thinking about it as much as you are? And I'm like, no, 
not at all. And they're like, well, then there's your answer. Like, you don't need to be so caught up in this because it's completely one-sided. And the only thing that you're doing, it's anxiety talking at this point. And that's been really big for me to learn. Um, Along with the life pie, like if I'm giving something in work, like work is pretty much always the biggest part of my life pie. I'd say it's like 40%. If I'm giving something more than 40% of my time, energy, passion, thoughts, whatever it might be, I'm, I'm typically doing too much. Like I'm, I'm thinking too much into this one avenue of my life when I have 60% of other things in my life that are so fulfilling and so important to me that I could be putting my attention elsewhere. You know what I mean? So like that's kind of where the visualization of the life pie is really, really good for me. But that's also been a big one for me to learn is that I can't give someone something or any or a situation energy if it's not being reciprocated to me. Now, this doesn't really mean relationships because there are definitely times in my relationship where I'm giving so much more than I'm getting and that's just okay and that's the season of life and vice versa. Like there's times where I'm not giving much of anything and my partner is giving so much and that's just how relationships go. Like they ebb and flow. So this really doesn't have to do with like a romantic relationship, but more so like friendships or situations that I can't control or work sometimes. Like there's just things that, I can't control that I will obsess over. And I just have to remind myself, like if this energy is not being reciprocated to me, like I need to just feel my feelings about it and then move on. And that's been really, really big for me. Okay. Number six, everyone processes feelings differently and I need to not take offense to the way that others work through problems. So one of the early things that I learned, um, was the different types of, um, processing that people do internal or external. I am an external processor, meaning when I have an idea, I have a problem, I have a thought, I have to externally process it, such as journaling. Okay. My whole last episode was about externally processing. So journaling, I will call my mom for literally anything. Like I have an idea, I'm calling my mom and her and I will talk about it and we will like come to a conclusion together through talking about it. That's also why therapy works really, really well for me because me and my therapist will talk through things and we come to a conclusion. I'm like, okay, this makes sense, but I had to talk through it to get here. Other people um, process things internally, meaning like you say something and then they don't need to talk through it. They do it themselves alone. So they think through things and they take time to come to a conclusion, whether it be minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, whatever it might be. And that was something that I had to learn the hard way, especially in relationships, because I'm such an external processor. And my boyfriend, for example, is an internal processor. So when I would say something to him and he like wouldn't answer me, I used to get so like upset and annoyed and mad and frustrated and be like, why aren't you saying anything back? And he would just be like, I, I just don't have anything to say. And I'm like, how do you not have anything to say? And then a couple of days later, he would come back around and be like, okay, so this is what I have to say about X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, what? Like it's days later and like, you're still on that. But it took him time to internally process things. And I first started noticing it in my relationship. And then I started realizing it in all of my relationships, in friendships, in any, any sort of relationship that I have at all. Some people externally process and some people internally process, and there's nothing wrong with either of them, but I just had to accept that and learn that for me getting frustrated when people don't want to talk through things is only my problem. Kind of going back to like, I'm the problem, but I'm the solution. It's not their problem. They are processing it. They're just doing it to themselves while I just have to talk about it to the world. You know what I mean? Um, So that was something really big that I had to learn is that everyone works through problems or situations their own way. And it's not up to me to decide if that's right or wrong. It's just up to me to accept it and not to try and change someone for how they think or how they process or who they are, but to just accept it. And remember this because I'm kind of going to come back to this in a little bit. So that was number six. Number seven, my next life lesson was to have compassion for everyone. Now, this is, I feel like, so much easier said than done, but really important. What I mean by this is so often um, 
I will just be in passing with people like whether I'm getting gas or I'm at Wawa or like at a red light and I will just see someone and it's so easy to be annoyed. Let Like I think of driving, for example, it's so easy to be annoyed while driving. Like if someone is not driving fast enough in front of you or if they don't put on a turn signal or they suddenly stop, like it's so annoying to be behind someone. Excuse me. It's so annoying to be behind someone like that. But then in moments when I'm that annoying person and I'm driving slower, it's probably because I'm looking for something. Or if I don't turn on my turn signal, maybe it's because I forgot or I didn't know the turn was coming up. Or if I'm just kind of, you know, it's just strolling along, not really going fast, like I'm just enjoying my day. And whenever I'm in those situations and I'm the person that I would be annoyed at, I find myself just having all the excuses like, oh, I'm just enjoying my day today or like whatever it might be. So I need, I I think of driving just because it's an easy example to think about, but I need to put myself in the shoes of the person that like I'm annoyed at when I'm behind them driving because maybe to them, like who knows, like maybe they're coming back from the hospital and they just had to say goodbye to someone that they loved. Or maybe this is their first time driving on in this area and they don't know where they're going or maybe they're just kind of waking up or maybe they have a newborn baby in the back seat. Like you don't know what someone is going through. And I just want to always remember to have compassion for everyone. And I feel like I've gotten a lot better at this. And whenever I feel like annoyed with someone or a situation, I just try and have empathy and compassion for every single person because when someone is outwardly going through something or maybe they say something nasty or maybe they do something reactive that isn't the best look and we tend to take it personally, it's really just, it's them going through something. And rather than fighting back with words of nastiness or being mean or annoyed, show love. Like they're going through something like this is just their way of get asking for help and they don't even know it. You know what I mean? So just being compassionate for everyone you know, purchasing the person's coffee behind you, like that could really make someone's day. Like maybe this coffee was something they've been saving up for all week and you go to Starbucks and you're like, I'm just going to pay for the person behind me. They get to the window and like that could have just made their day, could have saved their life. Like you don't know what everyone's going through and just to have compassion for everyone and just to show so much love to the person next to you. And whether you you know them or not, like just having love and empathy for everyone around is so, so, so important. And um, it it makes you feel good. It just shows you so much love and gratitude for everyone. And I just can't, um, I can't recommend this enough. Like just having compassion for everyone. It's so important and it's so, hmm, so special, so special. As I'm saying that, I feel like my first six tips, I feel like I was kind of like harsh. And I hope I wasn't like sometimes when I podcast, I black out and I don't really know what I'm saying, but I know in the moment, like what I'm saying is fine. And then I think back about it. I'm like, did I get my point across the right way? And I hope points one through six didn't feel harsh because I really feel like I've been very calm and I feel really good and very intentional and very like aligned and happy and at peace with my life right now. And I feel like one through six was like rehashing old ways of myself And I hope it came across like positive. I hope so. That's like the intention of all these lessons is like positivity and a better life and a better you. Okay. So I hope that came across that way. Now I'm like second guessing myself. Should I re-record? No, I don't want to re-record. Okay. Number six was that. Number seven, have compassion. Number eight, in order to accept people, you need to understand people. Not everyone is raised like you and therefore people act and think differently than you and they think that that is their normal behavior. So this is something that I've also learned in therapy and looking back, like it shouldn't really have been such a big light bulb moment, but it was like for me when I was like, you know, I think about situations that I've been in with people or I would, I think that's why I think this way. Cause I feel like I just keep talking about like situations with people. And I feel like I sound like such a drama starter and like a shit star, a shit star, but really it's just like life, like life happens. Okay. Yeah. I'm not being too harsh. Right. I mean, whatever. I'm just being vulnerable. I'm being normal. Okay. I'm just overthinking this anyway. I used to think that everyone thought like I did. 
And I used to think everyone was raised the way I was. And I never really thought that your upbringing could have such an impact on you as you grew up. Like the way that I grew up was amazing and I'm so blessed and I'm so grateful for my childhood and my teenage years and my early 20s. Now that I'm in my mid 20s, my early 20s, like I just, I've always had such a blessed life and I'm so grateful for it. And I know that not everyone has had as blessed of a life as I did, but I also with the same thought sort of thought that everyone looked at the world the way that I did and I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, what I mean by this is that, for example, I'll bring it to my relationship because I feel like this is just a good example. For example, in my relationship, my parents are together and not divorced. My boyfriend's parents are divorced. So when it comes to certain things in relationships, I approach it from a two parent household while he approaches it from a one parent household. And I used to not understand that. And I used to really not think that divorce, for example, had such an impact on a current relationship. But when you think about it, there's nothing wrong with his household. There's nothing wrong with my household. There's nothing right with my household. There's nothing right with his household. Like there's no right and there's no wrong, but it's just the fact of the matter. And like, we just approach situations differently. And that's something that I had to learn. I just had to accept him for who he was and how he was raised. And that's how I come at it through everyone now. Like people are the way that they are because of experiences that they've had in the past. And that's just who they are. Um, and it's once you can just accept people, life gets easier. And I'm going to kind of come back to this in a minute as well. Actually, I'll just go into it. Number nine, kind of going off of this. I've learned to accept people for who they are rather than wait for them to change into who I want them to become or who I've made them out to be in my mind. That was a big one for me. Like there have been so many instances, especially in dating when I like will really like someone, but they're just constantly letting me down. But you know what it is? They weren't letting me down. They were letting down this expectation I made of them in my mind down. That wasn't actually them. Like I thought they would be changed. I thought they would do X, Y, and Z. And when they would just constantly never meet my expectations, it was because I was talking them up to a person that they were never, you know, they've always showed me their true colors from day one. And it was me who wasn't accepting that. It was me who made these unrealistic expectations of who these people were. And I was the one that was getting hurt in return. So what I'm saying with all this is I've just really learned to accept people for who they are and love them for who they are. And now it's my choice if I want to be around them or not. They've shown me their true colors. They've done everything that they can. They've shown who they are right off the bat. And it's up to me to decide if those are the kind of people I want to be around or not. And that's not at their fault if it is or if it isn't. They are who they are and I just need to accept people for who they are. And that's a choice only I can make. So that has been really, really big for me. Like I'll talk to some of my girlfriends and they're like, I just wish my boyfriend would do this. Or they talk to their, I talk to my girlfriends about like some of their other friends are like, oh, well, I just wish she would be like this and da, da, da. And it's like, you know what? You can't change people. They are who they are. And it's only up to you if you choose to accept that or not. And that was really eye opening for me. And that was really, really, really big for me. Um, and I work through this every day with friends, with relationships, with like everything. It's just, it happens all the time. Like I think with family too, like I'm so blessed that I have such amazing parents. I have a great sister. Like I really have such a strong family and I'm really, really lucky. But I think a lot of times we think like our parents should be like X, Y, Z. Our parents should do this. Our parents should do that. And then we have these expectations that we just don't meet in our mind and we're constantly letting ourselves down. But if we just accept people for who they are and make it now our decision and we hold the power of if we choose to associate ourselves with, with them or accept them, that's up to us. And that power is really, really, really um, important and valuable and really has changed a lot for me. Okay, next, number 10. Family is everything. And the older I get, um, the more lucky I realize I am to still have my family. Um, and this sounds grim and it sounds really like depressing. Um, but it like is honestly like 
there are so many times I hear stories of people being like, oh, I lost my parents at this age and it's an age younger than me. And I can't even imagine like my parents are my best, best, best friends. And I am just so blessed to have my parents around and to have them as involved in my life as I am. And, you know, like I get why people move away and then move back to be closer to family. Like I get it. And to me, family is everything. And as I get older, I can't wait to have my own family one day. Like I always was, you know, I don't, I never really knew much about if I wanted kids and I still kind of am like, do I want kids? Do I not want kids? I don't know. But the more, the older I get, I feel like I just want to have like four little kids running around. Like I just want to really create a big family and to cultivate a big family and just family is so important and it's everything. And, um, the older I get, the more I really realize this and I do not take it for granted. And I am really, really lucky to have such an amazing, an amazing family and family is everything. Going off of that number 11, health is not something to be taken for granted. Working out every day, or even just once a week, whatever, working out, period, is a privilege. Eating healthy, eating well is a privilege. And me exercising, no pun intended, exercising that privilege, I am so grateful every single day for it. At the end of the day, health is all we have, health and family. And I really want to continue doing what is best for my mind, my body, and my soul. And I don't want like something horrible to happen for me to realize how important my health is. I just always want to know how important my health is and be so blessed and so grateful for health and do everything that I know I can to be as healthy as I can um, in this current season of my life. And that's going to change as I get older and as my interests change, like that health journey is always going to look a little bit different. But as long as I can go to bed at night, knowing that like I'm doing all that I can to live and lead a very healthy life for me that feels fulfilling and I'm happy and I feel really healthy in all aspects of my life. Um, and realize how blessed I am. I am so, um, I'm so grateful for that. And health is absolutely something that is not to be taken for granted. And it never, ever, ever is. Number 12, you're allowed to feel at peace and joyous. This is something that I feel like you're not allowed to say out loud that like, I just feel really good in my life right now. I feel like you always have to be going through something for your opinion to be heard or for your opinion to matter. Um, and I just feel really at peace. Maybe, maybe you don't know it because now I'm overthinking the first six where I'm like, was I really harsh? I just feel really at peace with things. In my whole life, I just feel really calm, really happy, really at peace, really joyful. And you know what's funny is remember that retreat that I went on um, in February? I went up to the Poconos. I did a three-day retreat and it was awesome. On the third day, we did Reiki and we were pulling cards and everyone had really deep cards and they were cards that would make everyone you know, cry and it was such an intimate thing and everyone got so close and their cards were so deep and so personal to them. And then my card was like, it was joy. It was just so light and airy and bubbly and just like happy. And it wasn't deep. And I was like, yeah, like this feels right. The other day I was with my friend and her and I really got to talking deep about inner work and a spiritual journey and, you know, just the things that you talk about. And she was pulling cards for me as well. And again, she pulled two cards for me. And both of them were just peace and calm. And I was like, yeah, like I feel really at peace and I feel really calm in my life and I feel really good with where I'm at. And I've learned to accept that. I stopped trying to look for something to complain about. I stopped trying to look for something 
to go wrong and just accept that like I'm really blessed that life is good right now and I'm really at peace with my life and I'm really at peace with my decisions of where I'm at in my life and I'm really calm. I feel really level-headed and I feel really good and I started to celebrate that and that feels really good. So celebrate it. You're allowed to feel at peace. You're allowed to feel joy. You're allowed to feel happy and I think everyone should like it. If you can celebrate where you're at in your life and it feels right to, I want you to. I encourage you to. It it felt really good. Okay, number 13. Life is in the gray. It is not black and white. And I used to think life was black and I used to think life was white. It was black and white. There's right and there's wrong. And that is it. That is not the case. And I have really learned that life happens in the gray areas. And I know I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I definitely just wanted to bring this back up because there are things growing up that I would see and I would say, if that ever happens to me, I will do this. And then lo and behold, something like that would happen to me. And now I'm like, oh God, I don't know. And that's just because life is in the gray. Life is not black and white. Life is not this is right, this is wrong, and this is what happens if this happens and that happens. As much as my type A brain would like for that to be the case of life, it's just not. And life is a gray area. And I've chosen to embrace the gray area, to live in the gray area, and to make gray look good on me. You know what I mean? Like I really like experiencing life as it happens and learning that there are much more than one way to approach situations or what we think we would do if a situation presented itself because you never really know. So that's really all I have to say on that. Life is in the gray. Yeah. Number 14, take social media with a grain of salt. Okay. Now this is obvious, but not everyone thinks about this all the time. Here's how I learned that. So I love reality TV. I watch reality TV all the time. Housewives, Love Island, Vanderpump Rules. Like I'm just obsessed with all reality TV. When my boyfriend will watch reality TV with me, for example, like Love Island, when him and I watch Love Island and someone will say something Um, he will get so like, he like feeds into it. He's like, why did they say that? Like, what the heck? And I'm like, okay, you have to understand, like it was probably edited. It was probably taken out of context. And like, this is their whole world. Like when they're in Love Island, like all that they know are these people for 10 weeks. Like the only thing that matters to them, like are their feelings and like their heightened emotions. Like, so yeah, if someone's going around the villa saying like Jesse's fake, It's probably because they're just bored and like this is their whole world, you know, and he'll be like, I just don't understand why they're saying that. Like she's not fake. I'm like, you have to under like you have to put context to it. You know what I mean? And social media is the same way. You have to remember that what you see is not always most of the time. It's not ever the reality. And it's easy to think that it is. So I challenge you to question what you see on social media and just remember that Most of the time, it's not what it looks like. Um, However, you can use this to your advantage. So something that like I was thinking about as I enter year 26, as I'm 25, is um, to kind of use like Instagram almost as like a visual mood board, right? To post on Instagram the life that I want to be living so that I just have to show up as that version. Like I have to show up as her. I have to show up as that. And that is like a pretty powerful way to look at something that is almost out of your power and put it into your power. I think that's pretty cool. So take social media with a grain of salt, but you can use it in your advantage to create a better you. Wow. I don't know if you guys heard that, but someone just outside of my window honked really loud. That was crazy. Okay. Number 15, the world. Oh my God. This is so fitting. The world has so much noise. That was funny as the car just honked. The world has so much noise. Block it out. This kind of goes along with social media. Um, there is so much that I see on social media that just does not serve me. But if I fed into everything that I saw, oh my God, I would like be the most unstable person in the whole world. Like I would spiral constantly. I would think the world is going to end any minute. Like I would just, 
I would be so confused as a person. I would be so lost as a person. What I'm getting at is the world has so much noise and it's always going to have noise and it's up to you to block out the noise and to just tune into the channel that you want to listen to, to tune into the life that you want to see built around you, that you want to create. That is up to you. You're the problem, but you're the solution. That's up to you. Okay. Number 16. Um, these actually next two are about running. Um, but this one's like more of an analogy. Number 16, to run faster, you need to run slower. This is so true in running and with life. So let me kind of break this down. So I'm currently training for a marathon. It's my first marathon ever, and it's in November of 2023, so this year. And when I started training, I was running really, 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 really slow. And I wanted to get faster. So I told my coach, I was like, I really want to, I have a goal in my mind for my marathon. I was like, I really want to hit this goal and I want to run at this pace. And I'm going to keep that to myself right now. But I was like, this is what I want to do. And he was like, all right. So then he just keeps putting slow runs and slow runs and slow runs. And I'm like, why slow? Like, I feel like I should be running like faster. I just don't feel like I'm where I need to be. And he's like, trust me, if you want to get faster, you have to run slower. We're lowering your heart rate so that you can eventually run faster. There's like a whole science behind it that I won't get into, but there really is a whole science behind it. And I've now been running for about four months, three months. I ran all January, February, March. So three months I've been running very consistently since um, my half marathon in 2021. And I have been noticing that I have shaved a minute off of my slow runs to the point where now when I run slow, I have to like really, really try to run even 30 seconds faster than my slow runs. So like what I, let me put like numbers to this. My slow runs used to be about 11 minutes, 30 seconds per mile. And now my slow runs are like 10, between like 1030 and 1050 a mile. And if I want to hit 1050 a mile, like today I ran and I did 1050 was my pace. I had to constantly tell myself to slow down today. Like I just want to go faster, but I'm very like cruise control at like 1015 when just three months ago I was at 1130 and I'm getting faster. I shaved a minute and 15 seconds off my mile just by running slower. It's cr- It doesn't really make sense, but it makes a lot of sense and it, it falls back into life. To go faster, you have to slow down. It's not a coincidence that whenever we come back from vacations or a switch up in our routines, that we feel so inspired, so motivated, and so like ready to get after it. Like that's not a coincidence. That is because when we allow ourselves to slow down, we are ready to jump back into something at full swing. We are really ready to dive right back into it. That is so important. And learning this lesson through running has been so valuable to me to slow down or sorry, to run faster. You need to run slower. That is the same in running. It's the same in life. And it's so valuable. That has been huge. And it's, it's been a weird lesson to learn. Let me tell you, it feels so unnatural. Like, Hey, I want to hit this pace that's faster. And then being told to slow down to hit a fast pace. It's like, what? But like, if you're giving 100% all gas, no brakes all the time, you are going to burn out. You are going to run out. You are not going to be able to hit your pace. You're not going to be able to hit your goals in life. But if you take it slow and steady and you have the time, you will be shaving minutes off your mile quickly. I've only been running three months and I shaved a minute and 15 seconds off of a mile for my slow pace. Like that is crazy. That's really wild, really, really wild. So I hope I keep doing that because I really have a goal in mind for this marathon. And maybe as I get closer, I'll say it, but like, I want to shave, like, I want to shave at least another minute off, another minute 15. Okay. Anyway, two minutes, whatever. I'll get there. Okay. Uh, Number 17, there's nothing, nothing. A couple things, but for 
we'll say this for the sake of the episode. There's nothing that a run and a shower can't fix. The shower we've known for a while. The run is new for me. There's nothing that a run can't fix. And it reminds me of that song. Ain't nothing that a beer can't fix. Mm, mm, that um, Who sings that? Is that Kenny Chesney? Let me look it up. Ain't nothing that a beer can't fix. Oh, Thomas Rhett. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, there's nothing that a run and a shower can't fix. If I'm having a crappy day, run. Oh my God, my whole day is turned around. If I feel disgusting, shower. Oh my God, I'm a new person. Like showers, like when I, when I was sick a couple weeks ago, I was down and out. And then I took a shower. I decided I wasn't sick anymore and I felt so much better. There's nothing that a run can't fix. There's nothing that a shower can't fix. It is like transformative what runs and showers do. It is so crazy. So crazy. Ain't nothing that a run can't fix. Mm-hmm. yeah okay so yeah that's just what I've learned recently and that has really changed my life nothing that a run can fix and it doesn't even have to be a long run but here's what I will say long runs are easier which is so weird and people used to always tell me that and I'm like literally get out of here but it's true like the first today I had an hour run the second half of that hour run was exponentially easier than the first half. The first half, you're getting warmed up. Your legs are a little stiff. They're heavy. You're tired. You start to hit like an interval of like, I feel good. And then you kind of like get back into like a slump a little bit. You're like, oh, I have so much more ahead of me. But as you get into it and you hit cruise control in a run, man, does it feel good. And it's really hard to break past that like threshold of like, this feels good in the beginning of a run because you're just not at that threshold yet. But once you get past it and like, it takes like for me, at least it takes like 30 minutes to get into a run. So if I have a 45 minute run, I'm going to feel like kind of like iffy for the majority of that run. So the longer my runs are, the better I feel. But all of this to say is that even if I have a 20 minute run, a 10 minute run, whatever it is, I always feel better after a run and after a shower. The results really are similar, but I get more endorphins with the run. But if I do a run and a shower, oh my God, unstoppable. I texted that to my boyfriend today. I said, I love you. I hope you have a great day. We are unstoppable. And I sent him the Sia song anyway. Okay. Number 18. I've been saying this throughout the entire episode and I truly mean it. This has been a phrase that I've been saying over and over again to myself, to everyone around me, to anyone that will listen. And it is that we are so blessed. We are so blessed. I'm constantly reminding myself of this every single day, but my God, I am so blessed. We are so blessed. There is so much to be grateful for. And the word grateful, I sometimes take for granted. And I know like I say it a lot on this podcast, I preach it and I really do live by it. But after a while, it gets easy to just hear a word and kind of forget the meaning of it. But I will constantly say like, oh, we are so blessed. And it is so true. Like I'm in this beautiful house speaking to a platform of people that actually want to listen an hour and 20 minutes in. Like that is crazy. Like I'm so blessed to have people that want to hear what I want to say. I'm so blessed to feel so loved by so many people to be able to go out for a run today to look out my window and have gorgeous, beautiful blue skies in front of me with sunshine pouring in my window. I'm so I'm just so blessed. And it's amazing when you say this to someone else and then they say it back to you. Like the other day I was at lunch and I was like, cheers, we are so blessed. And the person I was with was like, we are so blessed, like cheers. Like it's just it's so amazing. And like sometimes like, you know, when you drive and you're behind an accident and then you get to the accident and you're like, I'm just so blessed. Like we are so lucky that we are safe. And like, I hope they are. And like, there's just so many instances to just count your blessings and just remember like how blessed we truly, truly are. And just saying that over and over and over again to myself, to friends, to family, to literally anyone that will listen, saying it literally out loud, like we are so blessed it's just such an amazing life lesson and it's one that really sticks with me and I just feel so blessed, so blessed. And I'm so blessed to be entering year 25 and to have you guys with me. So yeah, that was not 25 lessons, but it was 18 
And I feel like that was a lot. Um, I hope I didn't sound negative in the first couple ones. I really just have learned through myself and other people and experiences so much about myself and growth and like a personal journey. And it's just been so incredible um, over these past 25 years to just learn so much. And these lessons have really stuck with me. And I think because of each and every one of these, I just feel so at peace and calm and I just feel really, really good and aligned and recentered and redirected. And I'm just so ready to be 25. So yay. I love it. Um, I truly do feel s- at such peace in this stage of my life. And I cannot wait to sit down on this podcast in five years in a beautiful, cozy podcast studio being signed to, you know, maybe a Spotify exclusive or something. And just say like, if you told me I was going to be living this life five years ago, I would have been able to visualize it, but not known how to get there. And I would be so proud of myself. So I cannot wait to live a life that I can only dream of, but I know is possible. I have really, really, really big plans for these next five years, and I can't wait to document them and accomplish them and hit them and just lay the foundation for a beautiful life. And I'm just so excited. So here's to the age that I've been waiting for for a lifetime and We are so blessed. We are so blessed. So happy Manifest Monday, guys. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode today. I hope you found value in it. And I will talk to you guys all next Monday. If you can, please be sure to rate the podcast five stars, share it with a friend or on your story or both. It helps the show so much. The show is growing so much right now. It's huge. It's crazy. It's like insane how fast the show is growing. So I really appreciate you guys. And I can't wait to... um, to see what's in store for the next five years. So happy Manifest Monday. I love you guys and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye guys.